Chapter 57 The First Part Now that I was left wholly to myself, I gave notice of my intention to quit the chambers in the temple as soon as my tenancy could legally determine, and in the meanwhile to sublet them. At once I put up bills in the windows, for I was in debt and scarcely had any money, and I began to be seriously alarmed by the state of affairs. I ought rather to write that I should have been alarmed if I had had the energy and concentration enough to keep me clear of a perception of any truth beyond the fact that I was falling very ill. The late stress upon me enabled me to put off the illness, but not to put it away. I knew that it was coming upon me now, and I knew very little else, and was even careless as to that. For a day or two I lay on the sofa or on the floor, anywhere according as happened where I should sink down, with a heavy hand and aching limbs and no purpose and no power. Then there came one night, which appeared of great duration and which teemed with anxiety and horror, and when in the morning I tried to sit up in my bed and think of it, I found I couldn't do so. Whether I had really been down in Garden Court in the dead of night, groping about for the boat that I supposed to be there, whether I had had two or three times come to myself on the staircase with great terror, not knowing how I'd got out of bed, whether I had found myself lighting the lamp possessed by the idea that he was coming up the stairs and that the lights were blown out, whether I had been inexpressibly harassed by the distracted talking, laughing and groaning of someone and had half suspected those sounds to be of my own making, whether there had been a closed iron furnace in a dark corner of the room and a voice had called out over and over again that Miss Havisham was consuming within it. These were things that I tried to settle with myself and get into some order as I lay that morning on my bed. But the vapour of lime kiln would come between me and them disordering them all, and it was through the vapour at last that I saw men looking at me. What do you want? I, I asked, starting. I don't know you. Well, sir, returned one of them, bending down and touching me on the shoulder. This is a matter you'll soon have to arrange, I dare say. But you are arrested. What is the debt? One hundred and twenty-three pound fifteen shillings and sixpence. Jeweller's account, I think. What is to be done? You'd better come along to my house, said the man. I keep a very nice house. He was referring to a lodging house for debtors. I made some attempt to get up and dress myself. When I next attended to them, they were standing a little way off from the bed, looking at me. I still lay there. You see my state, I said. I would come, you, come with you if I could, but in, indeed I am quite unable. If you take me from here, I think I shall die by the way. Perhaps they replied, or argued the point or tried to encourage me to believe that I was better than I thought, for as much as they, hang, they hung in my memory by this one slender thread, I don't know what they did, except they forbore to remove me. That I had a fever and was avoided, that I suffered greatly, that I had often, often lost my reason, that the time seemed interminable, that I confounded impossible existences with my own identity, that I was a brick in the house wall and yet entreating to be released from the giddy place where the builders had set me, that I was a steel beam in the vast engine clashing and whirling over a gulf and yet 
that I implored that my own person might have the engine stopped and my part in it hammered off, that I passed through phases of the disease I know of my own remembrance and did in some sort know at the time, that I sometimes struggled with real people in the belief that they were murderers and that I would all at once comprehend that they meant to do me good and would then sink exhausted in their arms and suffer them to lay me down. I also knew some of these things at the time. But above all, I knew that there was a constant tendency in all these people who, when I was very ill, would present all kinds of extraordinary transformations of the human face and would be much dilated in size. Above all, I say, I knew that there was an extraordinary tendency in all these people, sooner or later, to settle down into the likeness of Joe. After I had turned the worst point of my illness, I began to notice that while all its other features changed, this one consistent feature did not change. Whoever came about me still settled down into Joe. I opened my eyes in the night and in the night saw the great chair at the bedside with Joe sitting in it. I opened my eyes in the day and sitting in the window, smoking his pipe in the shaded window, still I saw Joe. I sank back on the pillow after drinking and the face that looked so hopefully and tenderly upon me was the face of Joe. At last, one day, I could, took courage and said, Is it Joe? And the dear old home voice answered, Which it hey, old chap? Oh, Joe, you break my heart. Look angry at me, Joe. Strike me, Joe. Tell me of my ingratitude. Don't be so good to me. For Joe had actually laid his head down on the pillow at my side and put his arm around my neck in his joy that I knew him. Which is, dear old Pip, old chap, said Joe, you and me was ever friends. And when you're well enough to go out for a ride, what larks? After which, Joe withdrew to the window and stood with his back towards me, wiping his eyes. And as my extreme weakness prevented me from getting up and going to him, I lay there penitently whispering, Oh, God bless him. Oh, God bless this gentle Christian man. Joe's eyes were red when I next found him beside me, but I was holding his hand and we were both happy. How long, Joe? Which you mean to say, Pip, how long have your illness lasted, dear old chap? Yes, dear Joe. Where's well, the end of May, Pip? Tomorrow is the first of June. And you've been here all that time, dear Joe? Pretty nigh, old chap. For as I says to Biddy, when the news of your being ill were brought home by letter, which it were brought by the post, and being formerly single, he is no married, though underpaid for a good deal of walking and shoe leather, but Wealth weren't the object on his part, and marriage was a great wish of his heart. It, it's so delightful to hear you, Joe, but I interrupt you in what you said to Biddy. Which it were, said Joe, that how you might be amongst strangers, and that how you and me haven't ever been friends a visit at the moment might prove acceptable. And, and Biddy, her word were, go to him without loss of time. That, said Joe, summing up all with a judicial air, that were the word of Biddy, go to him, Biddy say, without loss of time. In short, I shouldn't deceive, Lee, deceive you, Joe added after a little grave reflection. If I presented to you that the word of that young woman were, 
without a minute's loss of time. There Joe cut himself short and informed me that I was to be talked to in great moderation and that I was to take a little nourishment at stated frequent times, whether I felt inclined for it or not, and that I should submit always to all his orders. So I kissed his hand and lay quiet while he preceded me and indicted a note to Biddy with my love in it. Evidently, Biddy had taught Joe to write. As I lay in bed looking at him, it made me in my weak state cry again with pleasure to see the, the pride with which he set about his letter. My bedstead, divested of its curtains, had been removed with me upon it into the sitting room as the airiest and largest, and the carpet having been taken away and the writing table pushed into a corner and cumbered with little bottles, Joe now sat down to write his great work. First, choosing a pen from the pen tray as if it were a chest of large tools, and tucking up his sleeves as if he were going to wield a crowbar or a sledgehammer. It was necessary for Joe to hold on heavily to the table with his left elbow and to get his right leg well out behind him before he could begin. And when he did begin, he made every downstroke so slowly that he might have been six feet long, while every upstroke I could hear his pen spluttering extensively. He had the curious idea that the inkstand was on the side of him where it wasn't, and constantly dipped his pen into space, but seemed quite satisfied with the result. Occasionally he was tripped up by some orthographical stumbling block, but on the whole he got on very well indeed, and when he had signed his name and removed a finishing blot from the paper to the crown of his head with two of his forefingers, he got up and hovered about the table trying to effect his performance from various points of view as the letter lay there looking upon it with unbounded satisfaction. Not to make Joe uneasy by talking too much, even if I'd been able to talk that much, I deferred asking him about Miss Havisham until the next day. He shook his head when I asked him if he knew whether she'd recovered. Is she dead, Joe? Why, you see, old chap, said Joe in a tone of remonstrance, and by way of getting to it as by degrees, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but to say that she ain't living, Joe? That's nigher, that's nigher where it is, said Joe, she ain't living. Did she linger long, Joe? After you, after you was took ill, pretty much about what you might call, if you was to put it, a week, said Joe, still determined on my account at all costs to get at everything by degrees. Dear Joe, have you heard what becomes of her property? Well, old chap, said Joe, it do appear that she had settled most of it what I meant to say, tied it up on Miss Estella. But she had written out the little coddle shell in her own hand a day or two before the accident, leaving a cool 4,000 to Mr. Matthew Pocket. And why do you suppose, above all things, Pip, she left that cool 4,000 under him? Because she wrote of Pip's account of him, of the same said Matthew. I am told by Biddy that was her writing, said Joe, repeating the legal term as if it did him infinite good, on account of him being the same said Matthew. 
and a cool 4,000 pip. I never discovered from Joe how he derived the conventional temperature of the £4,000, but it appeared to make the sum of money more to him, and he had a manifest relish in insisting on its being cool. This account gave me great joy, as it perfected the only good thing I had done. I asked Joe whether he heard if any of the other relations had had legacies. Miss Sarah, said Joe, she had £25 per annum for to pay pills on account of being bilious. Miss Georgiana, she had £20 down. Mrs, um, what's the name of them wild beasts with humps, old chap? Camels, said I. Wondering why on earth he would possibly want to know. Joe nodded. Yet yeah, Mrs. Camels, by which I presently understood she had five pounds for to buy rush lights to put in put her in spirits when she woke up in the middle of the night. The accuracy of these recitals was sufficiently ob obvious to me to give me great confidence in Joe's informa information. And now, said Joe, you ain't that strong yet, old chap, that you can take in more than an additional shovelful today. But I'll tell you this. Old Orlix, he's been a bustin' out in a dwellin' house. Whose? said I. Not, I grant you, but what his manners was always give the blusterous said Joe apologetically. Still, an Englishman's house is his castle, and castles must not be busted, except when done in wartime. And what some others the failings on his part, he were a corn and seeds money in his heart. Do you mean that it was Pumblechute's house that has been broken into? That's it, Pip, said Joe. And they took his till, and they took his coot, his cash box, and they drank his wine, and they partook of his victuals, and they slapped his face, and they pulled his nose, and they tied him up to the bedpost, <laughs> and they given him a dozen, and they stuffed his mouth full of flour and annuals to prevent his crying out. But he knew it was Orlick, and Orlick's in the county jail. By these approaches, we arrived at unrestricted conversation. I was slow to gain strength, but I did slowly, and surely became less weak, and Joe stayed with me, and I fancied, I fancied I was little Pip again. For the tenderness of Joe was so beautifully proportioned to my need, that I was like a child in his hands. He would sit and talk to me in the old confidence and with the old simplicity and in the old unassertive protecting way so that I would half believe that all my life since the days of the old kitchen was one of those mental troubles and the fever that was gone. He did everything for me except the household work for which he engaged a very decent woman after paying off the laundress on his first arrival, which I do assure you, Pip, he would often say in explanation of that liberty, I find her a tappen the spare bed, like a tart cask of beer, and trawn off the feathers in a bucket for sale, which she would have tapped your bed next and drawed it off with you a lion on it and was then a-carrying away the coals gradually in the soup to a ream of the vegetable dishes and the wine and the spirits in your Wellington boots. 